Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Bless you. If you're visiting today, we're especially delighted and hope that you don't disappear. We have coffee upstairs and, and maybe a little something. Not, it's, not, it's not potluck today, but there's a little something downstairs to uh, uh, give us refreshment and a time for fellowship and, and fun together. So please don't disappear. Uh, a few things on our, our prayer list to uh, point out uh, today. Uh, Carl's nephew, Kevin, we are still offering prayer for him for some undiagnosed condition that's uh, somewhat serious. Uh, we are praying especially for Lori Rosted and Daniel Castilleja, who are both facing surgeries uh, in the next couple of weeks. And Marie is asking again to, to keep Scott Waldron at the top of our prayers as well, who's uh, dealing with some pretty difficult chemotherapy and, and cancer treatment things in the, in the weeks ahead. There are many others for whom we also pray and I commend the, the list to you and your service folder for throughout the week, as well as here, of course, in worship. Uh, there's many things on the calendar. To, uh, today, especially, it's a, a kind of a, a doubleheader. Uh, this is uh, Christopher Street West Pride Weekend in West Hollywood. Some folks are there for that. Uh, we have Lutherans volunteering in the booth, and there is also a uh, interfaith service and a Lutheran Methodist service going on right now uh, in the street. Uh, before the parade kicks off around noon. So we, we certainly keep them in mind and, and pray for the well-being of all those who are reaching out to the gay and lesbian community of that weekend. Tonight, uh, the Hollywood Master Chorale performs here in this space at 7.30. Uh, Ray and David have tickets and uh, would love to talk to you about the Master Chorale. They're a wonderful group of about 30 singers and they do an excellent job. They'll be presenting uh, premier, world premiere music tonight because they've uh, done some, uh, what am I looking for, commissions to uh, contemporary composers to write new works. And so it should be a very uh, exciting concert to hear. There are cards out, uh, outside to remind us of that. So pick one up, talk to Ray, talk to David, and plan to attend tonight. Um, let me see, Tuesday, food pantry uh, at, at 11 o'clock for those who need food, or if you can help, please keep us in mind as you do your grocery shopping so that we have things to share with those who hunger. Uh, 4.30 p.m. our Mariposa team will be meeting uh, Tuesday with the uh, representatives of the SMART continuum program of the LA Sheriff's Department. We're working on a new uh, ministry development to help those who are ex-offenders in the Hollywood area. So that's 4.30. 7 o'clock council meeting. We have a lot going on, on on Tuesday. Wednesday our potluck of Bible study continues in the book of Genesis uh, and then that's kind of we get to coast a little bit. Uh, choir has knocked off for the summer, so uh, we don't have anything else big for the rest of the week, except, of course, worship next week. So, God bless you. Thank you. Um, we turn now to the readings of the scriptures for today. The first reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord. Please join in reciting with me Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me.
You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. You, Lord, with your favor made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. The second reading is from Galatians chapter 1. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the Church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who was who had set me apart before I was born, called me th through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I, I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of me. The word of the Lord. Be Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bier bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. We didn't just make this stuff up. That's what Paul seems to be saying to the Christians in Galatia. We didn't just make this stuff up. 
Many people today are having their doubts about the Christian faith. Parents are saying that they've left it to their kids to decide what to believe when when they grow up. 12-step recovery uh, people are, are saying that they turn their lives over to God as we understand him. But they don't know from person to person what that means. It's a free-for-all out there, isn't it? I mean, people like L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology fame just make up their own re- religions or they shape one to their liking. Through the amazing Internet and, and Google, I just found a very useful guide if you're thinking of starting your own religion. Brian Gallagher, who styles himself as the keeper of the one true path to paradise, offers free of charge how to create your own religion in 10 easy steps. And it, you can even print it out for free. Isn't that amazing? In some ways, things really haven't changed in thousands of years. When countless other religious beliefs flourished back then, and, and they had many followers, most of those ideas eventually died out or, or people stopped following them. But when we look back, say, for example, at, at the Latter-day Saints or Islam or, or Arianism or other cosmic ideas and systems with with different beginnings, we have to realize there was a time when the Christian faith was brand new in town itself. And so Paul says, we didn't make this stuff up. In today's second reading, Paul is writing a letter back to congregations that he had started on his mission trip into the region of Galatia. They were churches made up primarily of of former pagans, not Jews who had converted to Christ, but pagans who had come to know Christ. Scholars think that uh, this brief letter, it's only eight pages long, was written between 50 and 60, perhaps no more than about 20 years after the lifetime of of Jesus. And further, we know that times were already changing in this young church because the first believers were Jews who had accepted that Jesus is Lord. But already the church leaders, those apostles and elders who had gathered together at what we'd have to call the the church's very first convention in Jerusalem, had decided that they should also go out to outside Jewish circles to the Gentiles, take the message of Christ to the whole world, tell the nations, tell anyone about Jesus Christ. But in the midst of these years, some Jewish Christians who were not willing to let go of Judaism made their own trip into this region of Galatia. And they insisted, when they came to these congregations, that that Paul had it wrong, that all Christians really needed to keep all the commandments of the Jewish faith, to abide by all the rules and the regulations of the Torah. The people of these new congregations very quickly felt uneasy and confused and and conflicted. They they were not yet clear on the message, and so they were easily misled to to hear these other voices as well as what Paul had taught to them. So we hear Paul's shock in, well, actually, it started in last week's reading where he said, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all, he said. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So we come to his line here this morning. We didn't make this stuff up. Or, well, okay, I'll be a little bit more literal with you. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. But it seems to be Paul's word against these other guys. Both had good faith reasons to support their view, but they had very different views. I bring all of this up today because there are very different points of view about religious faith today, right? All kinds of the same questions of faith and all kinds of different opinions out there. One point of view would be to take Paul's word for it in the plainest possible sense. I received a revelation from Jesus Christ. To them, this means bluntly, if you put it on a bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. To them, this means that, that the gospel kind of fell straight out of heaven, you know. This, this is what it says, word for word, and take it or leave it, the whole thing or nothing. Author Rob Bell has recently 
gotten into trouble with those kinds of Christians. He's, he's the author of a new book called Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. That's quite a title for a book. I haven't, uh, I haven't read it yet, but on the back cover, here's a teaser for you where he says, God loves us. God offers us everlasting life by grace freely through no merit on our part, unless you do not respond the right way. Then God will torture you forever in hell. And then one more word he just says, huh? I think that maybe is where a lot of people are. Huh? Is that really what the gospel says? Is that the kind of revelation that Paul is pushing for us? Or the kind of revealed eternal truth that we're supposed to follow, absolutely buy into this forever and ever? Because if we don't, we'll burn in hell. Traditionally understood, the old-time religion of Christianity promises eternal life and God's love, but it's also, even without the hell part, it's unbelievably complicated. It's loaded with religious rules and caveats and, and warnings and fetal, mortal sins, or venal, I guess. I can't see that's not even part of it, so I can't say it right. Elaborate rituals that have to be conducted exactly right by the one people, the, the, the small group of people who were trained to do this perfectly, and they're controlled, and then there's dogmas and popes and councils that work this stuff out for 2,000 years. And you know, who would care today? Traditionally understood, a new believer, a, a convert from paganism or from nothing, or a seeker, or an individual who, who thinks of herself or himself as spiritual but not religious, I think all those kinds of people would just run not walk, but run away from this, this kind of stuff. It, it doesn't seem to be the gospel that Paul's talking about, and begging the Galatians to, to be loyal to him. In fact, it seems like the very same stuff that he himself walked away from when he came to Christ. Leaving behind the, the law of Moses, the rules and the regulations and, and the meaningless rituals. But here he has said, Right now, I received this gospel from Jesus Christ. Did he mean, really, that it came in a vision or a flash of light from heaven or that it was etched in stone like the Ten Commandments in, in, in the book of Exodus, or, or as with Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints, that it was written on golden plates that were shown to him by an angel from heaven? Again, the serious student of the Bible, serious people who do this for for their work, people who research and publish books and, and lecture in our colleges and seminaries, they remind us that this letter to the new Christians in Galatia was written before the, the four books of our Bible that we call the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it was written before Paul even had anything that told him all the details about, about Jesus' life or, or told him the parables that, that Jesus gave. Paul never met Jesus. Paul was an outsider to the apostles, those who walked with Jesus day by day. For Paul, revelation meant that something was disclosed to him that previously wasn't, wasn't apparent. It just wasn't understood. Revelation for Paul meant that the uncovering or the, the unmasking, the making clear, understandable, something that never before had, had made sense. And this revelation he called gospel, which of course we get in, in our language today as good news. But the other point of view from the traditionalists, from those who insisted on the, the strict observance of, of all the commandments and the laws, is what Paul said was revealed to him. We did not make this stuff up, he insisted, and it probably was sort of a stump speech that he gave over and over throughout the churches and in Galatia, and even the, the next province over named Phrygia. And so I'm quoting from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, where Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you to free you from all those things by which you could not be freed by the, by the law of Moses. The Apostle explains in detail, but now he gets it. Now he understands that it's the death and the resurrection of Jesus which has freed us from all those things we couldn't be free from by legalism and law and religious uh, rules and regulations. In a sense, this 
almost, not quite, but almost makes me think of freedom from religion, which is a phrase we hear much in, in our news, rather than freedom of religion. If you think of religion as something that's binding and controlling and making demands on, on the devout that, that we have to do to prove our faithfulness or to control our behavior, Paul is announcing freedom from all of that. For here Paul says, you've heard it about my former life, my earlier way of life in Judaism. And the rest of the text that David just read for us, in that Paul was explaining all of this former way of life, all the zeal and the rigors and religious traditions of his fathers. And he goes on to explain that he didn't get this gospel from, from Peter and the other apostles before he started proclaiming the death and resurrection of Jesus. His, his message here, his, his point, is that the truth came to him in Jesus Christ. It, it wasn't contrived or made up. It wasn't the result of consulting all the other big-name people back in headquarters, but revealed in Christ's life so that he and, and others who walked away from religiosity and rule books could finally understand God's love. We are saved, he wrote somewhere else, by grace through faith and not by works of the law. This is big, my friends. Not, you know, just big back then in a world that no longer exists. This is big now because the gospel still means the good news of God's grace given to anyone as a gift. Seeing the faith take new directions in our times. Just before I completed my, my own education and training way back, the Lutheran Church had just then started ordaining women. Even though the rules in the scripture say that women shouldn't speak in public, after prayer and study for a long time, the Lutheran Church said, no, we think that women have just as much ability, power, gifts, and, and place in the church to proclaim the word of God. And then we've seen the emergence of both James Cone's black theology and then liberation theology that swept all through Latin America as well, reminding us that God is concerned with the poor and the oppressed. And then came gay and lesbian people, beginning in, what was it, June of 1969 in New York City, which has caused all the churches to, to react to what had been unthinkable before that. Gay, crime, probably was an oxymoron to many in the 1960s. But pride parades like the one being held today in West Hollywood are now held all over the world. They even had them in Jerusalem, in Israel. And during our lifetimes, the Christian church has had to wrestle with constant change, not all of it easy or comfortable, in which believing Christians have kept on proclaiming the gospel, revealed to them that God's love is so great, it is so wide, the arms of God can wrap around all people. All people. Women and men, black and white, privileged and poor, gay and straight, and all the shades in between. There is no limit to God's grace. Well, how can, how can we do that? I mean, the Bible says, how can Christians become so open-minded, so liberal, if you will, as to say that God's grace extends to people that tradition always said were outside God's grace, outside God's grace? After all, we still have those other Christians around that insist that we have to keep all the rules of the old covenant, even if we accept the Jesus as Lord. They insist, and I'm, I'm thinking of people like uh, Fred Phelps in Topeka, Kansas, or Pat Robertson on TV, or, or the late Oral Roberts, people like that, that to be a Christian is really sort of to, to eat a bitter cake. You know, okay, it has a little sweet icing on top, that's the gospel, but you still have to swallow the whole thing, all the bad news with the good. They teach that the, the truth is, it is the whole religious tradition and practices the laws and commandments and abominations and denominations and, and the gospel is a little reward to, to uh, go along with that or towing the line. Sweet deal, huh? Or as Ryan Bell has said, unless you do not respond the right way, then God will torture you forever. Now, that is the choice. Whether we buy all of that or we say, no, God is speaking gospel and it's finally making sense, finally revealed in Jesus Christ. There are so many ways to explain what we mean by revelation. It dawns on you. Uh, it's an awakening. In 
enlightenment. All that is using the images of, of light being cast on something that previously wasn't even visible, so it was in the dark. Uh, revealing, disclosing, like, like pulling the cover back and looking inside. Being born again, born again. New life, resurrection. More images of a new beginning out in the light and in the open air. This is what revelation is, the aha of human life when it finally makes sense. So the Christian faith today is being practiced differently than it has been. I say so be it, because the gospel proclaimed by Paul and revealed in Jesus Christ is that everything has been changed by God's grace. Everyone is a new creation, and the former way of life is worthless in a day when, when we're all seeking God's love and truth together. This is big, my friends, because it's God's open-ended invitation to, to trust those promises and to come not discouraged or pushed away by the writers of, of rule books, but to come to the light of day in Christ and to then draw everyone else we know into that wide embrace.